Hello there. I'm Eric Meyer. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. I am Brian Cardell. I'm also a developer advocate at Egalia. And we uh, thought we'd take this end of year podcast to talk about uh, sort of uh, the the year that's ending and things that happened in it. Uh, this was um, this was inspired a little bit by posts like the uh, CSS Wrapped 2023. Uh, post that was put up on the uh, Chrome Developer blog, and uh, we thought we'd get one of the authors here to talk about that and other things that happened on the web platform. So, welcome, Brahmas. Hey, how are y'all? Please uh, let people know who you are and what you do. Yeah, so uh, my name is Brahmas. I'm a Chrome Developer Relations Engineer at Google, and I'm mainly concerned with, with CSS and Web UI, so that's what I get to write and talk about. Nice. It's fun having jobs like this, isn't it? Where you t write about stuff and talk about stuff you want to write and talk about anyway. Yeah, I remember before I joined Google, I was doing all this stuff like after hours. And right. now it's part of my job. So <laughs> it's amazing. Wait, they pay me to do this? That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot to talk about. So we don't really have time to shoot the breeze necessarily. <laughs> there's so many things to cover. Um, what are some things that stood out to you, though? Oh well, like there's there's two main things that stood out to me is uh, because I worked on them um, as well, are uh, namely scroll driven animations and view transitions. I think those are like two huge additions to the web platform, and um, they're right now available in Chrome. Um, but we ha we have like good signals from other vendors that they will also be working on it, and who knows, maybe it will be included in Interop 2024. So things are looking good for them. Okay, so um, uh, you know. I feel like those are things that kind of go together and what are, you know, what is it about them that you feel is, I mean, other than that you worked on them because clearly that's a major signal, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, you know, what is it that they make possible? Yeah. So uh, scroll driven animations allow you to take an existing uh, CSS animation or a web animation and link that to a scroller. So the animation no longer runs at the tick of a wall clock, but it, it's driven by you actually scrolling from the top of the page to, to the very bottom. Mm. And what I really like about this is that it leverages CSS animations and web animations. So you don't really need to learn anything new. And you can also get to take advantage of CSS animation that, for example, they know how to run stuff on a compositor. So they're not blocking the main thread and this is like a win for everybody because we've seen these patterns on, on quite a few websites and now you get to do them like properly. Uh, yeah. Mm. It's, it's so exciting. Yeah. Rather than having to sort of script everything yourself. You yeah. You're done using like a scroll listener with some blocking JavaScript. Mm -hmm. You need to mm -hmm. do the get bound incline rect thing and whatnot. And yeah. yeah. So scroll driven animations, much, much better to do that. Okay. And you said there's good signals. So that's, that's good. And on view transitions, I, I I didn't know quite what the signals were. And I also, it feels like there's maybe some changes that might have to be happening at the spec level. Do you know where that stands right now? Yeah, so what's, what's shipped right now in, in Chrome um, is a single page application view transitions. So you need JavaScript to, to actively do transitions from one page state to the other with mm. some little JavaScript. Um, and we are working on an, uh, landing MPA support. So like, multiple page applications that that's what mpa stands for which is like oh you just mean web websites. pages <laughs> yeah exactly exactly how we did it 20 years ago i like click a link and you end up on another page crazy yeah um so so that's what in in what's in the in the pipeline for that and we're also like working on like when i say we i mean uh us Chrome at Google, um, we're also working on like improving the experience for developers um, because right now, for example, you need to sprinkle view transition names, unique values on each and every element, but maybe you want to do like something generic, like adding a class name onto a bunch of elements in one go. Uh, yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> it's funny because on our last show, we, uh, the topic was like the struggle to keep up. And one of the things that we talked about is like the, the earlier you try to follow something, the more noise and, and stuff you have to to keep straight in your head that like that's not real yet, right? And then uh, people who come along at the end, uh, you know, like they just have to learn what 
actually works in all the browsers. And so like it's way more efficient for most people to follow at the end. But it's also kind of ironic because we do need more people, not everybody, but we need more people to follow earlier. So um, since this is an end of year post, it's difficult to know like which things to focus on. But like I think that there's probably enough that we could focus on the things that are just in like just in at least two browsers hmm. and um, ideally in all three. And uh, I would like to have you back at some point to talk specifically about the scroll stuff um, because I, I do think that's a huge topic all by itself. Yeah. Yeah. Look, looking forward. And what, what you just mentioned about like, sometimes it's, it's hard to keep up and then you have to wait until it's, it's landed in all browsers. And I think that's perfectly fine um, because for scroll driven animations, for example, the Chrome engineers have been working on this since, since like four or five years ago. They, they started at it before I even joined the company. And that, that was so hard to keep up with because it, it has changed the spec and whatnot. So yes, yeah, sometimes it really does pay off. Like just wait until it's available in all browsers. It has settled a bit and mm -hmm. then go in. Uh, and even so, um, you don't have to keep up with all the new shiny stuff. Like maybe you can find like an excuse to, to put it into a project or find a good use case. And then might be a very good time to, to start learning it. Yeah. So um, some stuff that is in all browsers. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at the CSS wrapped post, which uh, I believe you had a hand in. Um, and uh, trigonometric functions for values in CSS. You can have values that are based on sines and cosines and why? <laughs> Yeah, this is often the topic where people go like, oh no, maths, <laughs> I remember this from back in school, I don't want to do this. Um, well, why it, it helps with like, if, if you have something like, for example, a, a circular um, UI pattern where, where you lay out some items on a circle, um, mm -hmm. to do that properly, you need to sign in the cosine. Um, huh. So this, this landed in Chrome this year, I think we were last to ship it. Um, so this is available cross-browser um, for, for, yeah, for more than half a year now. Yeah. And then... Can I can I hijack that really quickly and say, um, while it's not in your post, the true reason that we did that is to give everyday people something to write about and use MathML in their, hmm. in their uh, posts. Because uh, another thing that happened this year uh, that isn't in the post is that MathML is now supported in all the browsers as of, yep. uh, I think it was January this year, Chrome 109. That's pretty huge. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's been very interesting to to sort of play around with that. I mean, not everybody needs um, math markup <laughs> in their in their documents, but when you do, having MathML support is really good. And yeah, it, it looks really nice in in basically all the major browser browser engines. Um, you get some really nice rendering. Um, and then there's also the uh, the complex nth child selection was one of the things that that you talked about in 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 the post. And this I mean this is the of keyword basically yes or is there more to it than that? Yeah, that's that's the of part. So if you have something like nth child or nth last child, uh -huh. um, you do something like even or odd or two n. Um, but with, with this extra addition, you can like pre-filter the subset, which you are applying the nth logic on. Um, so you can say, I want to have the even of the dot special elements, for example. So the engine will then first select all the special elements and then mm -hmm. apply the two n logic onto that. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. And now it's apparently in, in all the engines. Um, as of this year. And similarly, and this one blows my mind that this uh, actually has come together so quickly, selector nesting. It's in uh, Chrome as of 112, uh, Firefox as of 117, uh, Safari is 16.5, where you can nest selectors inside of other selectors the way that um, you, know, you can do in SAS, for example. Yeah, and pe people have been wanting this for, for ages, right? It's like why <laughs> technologies such as uh, SAS and LAS and Stylus <laughs> came along. Um, and, and I really like this feature because it shows that the, the web catches up. Like we see some novel innovations uh, in user land. And then it's like, okay, this should be part of the web platform. It should be part of the core of the web. And now nesting, we, we finally have it. We, we, we have it in our browsers. Yeah, this is why I really like preprocessors um, because they are 
a way for CSS authors to experiment with things beyond what native CSS can do. And then, yeah, like you say, that clearly became very popular. In many cases, it's the only reason why people at least started using uh, preprocessors. And the working group looked at that and said, we should make that native so that people don't have to use a preprocessor and the um, the use of that can uh, take advantage of the uh, the 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 engine optimizations. Yeah, and, and another example uh, that's like in the same category are uh, CSS variables, mm. where people have been using variables in their preprocessors for for quite some time. Um, but what I really like is, for example, how, how this got implemented into the web platform. We didn't just get static variables. We got custom properties. That's how variables are implemented in the web. Yeah. And because they are properties, they can respond to media queries. Uh, they can change values on the fly, like on hover, and then all your calculations uh, automatically update. So the, the preprocessors like cleared the way and said, okay, people want this. But then what we got on the platform is like even better. It's variables on steroids, basically. Yeah, you can you can have that sometimes. Um, layout wise, subgrid came to Chromium. Um, <laughs> yes, it, it took a while uh, compared to the other browsers, but Chromium, uh, you know, Chrome browsers did get subgrid. What um, I know that some listeners will probably know at least a little bit of the story, but I, I think a lot of people probably don't realize like what took so long. Not to not to be a jerk about it, just like literally, <laughs> why was it that, um, you know, what was it that Chrome needed to do in order to make Subgrid happen this year? Yeah, so Subgrid, um, we've been working on this for, for quite a while. And Subgrid is something that was uh, contributed by, by the people at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's a lot of contributors on the, on, the, on the Blink engine, the underlying engine of the Chromium browser. And Microsoft are, are the folks who contributed Subgrid. Um, and, and one of the reasons um, I think it took so long is that there were like a few tests and edge cases that needed to, to be cleared out up front, um, which were like some, some vague areas in the spec maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and Ian Kilpatrick, uh, one of our engineers who, who, who oversaw um, the project, um, was like very, he wanted to be clear that, that we are shipping the right thing and that it doesn't break in certain cases and whatnot. Um, so mm -hmm. that, that's why it took a while. Yeah. And I'm given to understand there was also some engine rewriting that had to happen. Um, yeah, be, be, before Subgrid ever became an option uh, in Blink, um, it was the whole Blink NG rewrite, the whole layout NG rewrite uh, from, from a while ago that laid the foundations to finally enabling Subgrid this year. Um, so right. yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lengthy process. Yeah, so I mean, it wasn't as simple as, oh, well, we've got Grid, just add Subgrid. Like, the really- <laughs> No, no, it, it was- completely have, refactored. Yeah, we, we have grit. Let's redo the entire foundation so that we can build some grit. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, sometimes that's what happens with browsers, right? It's, you find out that, you know, good faith assumptions made five, 10, 15 years, whatever, you know, years ago, don't mat, don't mesh with new thing whatever the new thing is. In your case, it was subgrid. For another browser, they might have to completely rewrite their compositing engine to deal with a new filter or something like that. Just because like, they, nobody anticipated that this filter would, that the, some new filter would come up in the future. And they realize, oh yeah, we made a whole lot of assumptions that make that next to impossible. We're gonna have to redo this whole section of the engine in order to to make that work. And in your case, that happened to be layout, which is probably slightly fundamental. Um, I don't want to skip ahead or anything, but I feel like a little bit like we're burying the lead and like a little kid at Christmas, like, hey, we got container queries and has this year. Yeah, we're getting like, there. Wow. In like all of the browsers, amazing, right? Like, mm -hmm. holy cow. Literally for, you know, as long as I can remember, um, these have been sort of like the top two. I mean, the number one was has until uh, responsive web design came along. And then, you know, everybody who used that for about 10 minutes was like, okay, but how do I do it on like the element and not the viewport? And the answer was like, no, you can't do that. Right. So they wanted so, container queries. Yeah. So then container queries became the number one thing. It has became the number two thing, but <laughs> wow. Right. Like, wow. Like amazing. Amazing. 
Yeah, it's it's, I, it's I crazy. Mean, not how to, much... not to always plug this every time this comes up, but like Galia <laughs> had a role in both of those, and I'm really proud of that. That's true. Yeah, it's crazy how how much the web like has has evolved the, the past years. It's it's like there's a real uh, CSS renaissance, whereas before I was under the impression like okay we we're, we're getting some new features and and things not always work across every browser, but fast forward to to now 2023 like we we see that browser vendors are actively working together. We have things like interop. Um, we are yeah. planning to like we yeah we we should like all release this this year, um, and we are getting so much powerful features like 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 has that you mentioned the, the bug report dates back to i think it's 20 years ago that the first bug report was like hey i need something like this in css and now in 2023 it's finally the year that we have it yeah it first appeared in uh, 1999 in the first draft uh called css3 it was called subject at that point but the, the idea was the same and it very quickly became has yeah, I mean, like you're saying, we're working together a lot and interop, I think that's a really, like, we will do a whole show on that probably too. Uh, definitely, we'll all probably write posts about that at the end. But um, mm -hmm. I would like to call out, like, what a big deal that has been um, by just throwing out, like, a number. <laughs> um, the, okay, I need to pause while I find my window where it was <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that somehow lost no that worries. yeah okay so i do want to just call out like this year we added a thing that was missing in all the previous years which is what is the interop number like what is the metric so this is previously we would say like chrome passed this many like Firefox passed this many, Safari passed this many, and we would say like your score is 80, 70, 80, or something like that, right? Um, but this year we have another number called the interop number, which is like, what is the interoperable set that they all share? And that number is like much lower. <laughs> so um, this year at the beginning of the year, the total score for across all the focus areas was less than 60% that was the the interop score and as of now uh it's up over 93 percent that is amazing i think interop is one of those things i said this before that i feel like you wish didn't need to exist like you wish this is just sort of mm -hmm. like how it works yeah but it is phenomenally hard to prioritize this stuff i mean i can tell you as you know, people being involved in the process of organizing it and, and choosing the focus areas and all that kind of stuff. It is astoundingly hard to, even when you do sit in a room together and work on shared priorities and things, it's very, very difficult. So it's amazing that we do it. And I, I really hope we continue to do it for a long, long time. It clearly has huge benefits. Yeah, and often it's, it's always... An, uh... Let me rephrase it. And often I think it's also like a hard sell internally, whereas, yeah, we, we want to spend a lot of time fixing some bugs so that this works interoperable in all browsers versus, oh, we're going to ship this shiny new thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a delicate balance that, that, that you have to strike uh, because I can, I can see that, that vendors want to want to ship new features. Um, mm -hmm. But this, this interop part, this making things bug free is also very, very, very important because it's yeah, even these, these little details. It's like a dead by a thousand cuts, right? It's the tiny details that, that make things hard for developers. Yeah. Even that, um, we like interop does include new features that we all agree to focus on. And like, even that has a really outsized impact. Like you would think that it's easier to get, and it is easier to get everybody to be like, oh, let's do this thing. There's a lot of is easy to sell that. But the advantage of everybody doing that at the same time, you can think about this, like everybody who listens to this show probably is familiar with like the waterfall diagrams and things that are synchronous and asynchronous. And like, you, you can just imagine that like, okay, well, if let's assume that Chrome does it first because well, they often do it first. <laughs> um, you know, like they invest a bunch of money, they do it, they get it, they ship it. But then we have to wait until it gets into somebody else's and maybe it gets through halfway or maybe it takes a year. Um, then somebody else implements it and maybe that inspires the next people. But like what we've seen is that sometimes like summary details, I mean, that that took like 
I don't know, a decade or something like that before we had it interoperable in all the browsers. Um, and it's not that big a feature, right? Like if you can just get people to focus together, you cut down that waterfall because you just like parallelize it. And the other thing that comes from that is that like we don't bake mistakes into the platform for like five years before the next browser gets there and says, gee, that seems like a mistake. Yeah. You know, ideally not. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Some of the, I know that we've all, we've talked almost exclusively about CSS thus far, uh, but um, there's a, there's a lot more that that's happening in, in the platform and, and some of them, some of, some of it intersects with uh, CSS. And one of the things that I actually, um, I actually learned from your, uh, the post about CSS wrap 2023 was the scripting media query where you could literally in a media query and a CSS media query, find out if JavaScript's enabled or not, and then have styles based on that. Um, and that shipped in browsers this year. Uh, in fact, um, very recently in a couple of cases, like uh, a week ago as we record this. Um, but that's really cool, right? That you could just say, Hey, if there's no JavaScript, Maybe you make a, a little widget on the page, just display none because with no JavaScript, it's not going to work. Um, or maybe you um, you could put up a little flag that, that you know, says, you know, JavaScript's disabled, um, whatever. Like that's, that's really nifty, that, that, that um, intersection between sort of between CSS and JavaScript. Yeah, and I think it's one of those cases where this has been in the spec for quite a while that this existed for for quite some time uh, but it's only now that that it's it's in all browsers um and it was just a matter of yeah we, we need to pick this up and we need to do this yeah and that, it looks i mean from the article there's a number of things that are happening with media queries um you, there's a one about um, the refresh rate of a device how does that work exactly because i wasn't really clear about that yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with that one as well. Um, Adam worked on that one. Uh, but basically, you can query, like, how, how fast is the refresh rate of this device? And is it either fast, slow, um, or none? Um, and none, for example, is is a book. Uh, if you print something, printed oh. media has, has an, an update rate of none. Okay. Um, yeah. so, so you can, like, swap out a, a GIF maybe for a static image, uh, something like that. Hmm. Okay. Of course, you could also use at media print in that case, but there are other devices like an e-reader, for example. Um, so you can target them that way. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the reduced transparency media query, which is, it reminds me of the uh, animation, uh, prefers animation or does not prefer animation queries. Um, yeah, it's 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 another um, like preference query where you as a user can say I'm I'm fine with motion or I'm not fine with motion. And the same with the transparency, which is uh, an operating system setting where you can say no, I don't want these translucent windows where where like the window underneath bleeds through. And then you can uh, flag the same uh, on your website so that you can like say okay, we we don't want to do these the half opacity things. Um, we want to make them like opacity one so that you can't uh, see through it. Hmm. Okay. Popover, popover is a good one. Uh, that's uh, you know something that came from OpenUI. Uh, I think it's the first thing really to come from OpenUI, and um, it's pretty great. Like it's declarative. Uh, it really um, is. I, I think a little overly basic without the CSS bit that goes with it that's uh like anchor positioning yeah. but it's definitely a huge step in the right direction yeah and then like you say popover um I, I remember the discussions from back in the day like first it was oh yeah we should have a dedicated popover or back then it was even called pop-up <laughs> like we should have a dedicated element for that and those discussions like uh, transform into no we should make every element to be able to be a popover. Um, so that transformed into the popover attribute. And like you say, like the popover attribute by itself, okay, it, it does things, uh, but then there's all these extra CSS additions that you can uh, apply to, to make things smoother. So you can, for example, you can animate an element in as it enters the top layer. 
um, which is what the popover does. It shows thing it shows things in the top layer, um, so you can animate them while they enter, while they exit. Um, yeah, it's 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 all nice that that we can do that because now you can create like these really rich and smooth uh, user interfaces um, that we most typically see in native apps nowadays. But like I said before, the web catches up. Mm, yeah, it's also uh, exclusive accordions, which is. Um something that it feels like we should have had a long time ago. Um, like almost everybody who sees summary detail, like intuits that you could just take a bunch of them and make an accordion. And I mean, more or less you can, they lack a group, you know, they lack some kind of group, but other than that, they're very similar. Um, but exclusive accordions where only one is open at a time, um, exist all over the place. Um, I don't uh, think that they're always a good idea. Um, oftentimes it's much better to let the user open like or close as many as you want. Um, but there's a nice uh, compromise in the design of exclusive accordion where um, you can actually close them all. You just can only open one at a time. Um, so that really simplifies the problems that you're tackling, but it's pretty nice. Um, and it's shipping in uh, Safari as of like yesterday, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, gives you a hint when we recorded this, I guess. Uh, and it's been in, <laughs> in Chrome since 120. And uh, I'm pretty sure we're working on it in Firefox. But it's it's pretty simple. You just add a name attribute to a, a number of details, and that makes them all participate as part of a group. Um, yeah, there is a we... part of this that I really want to mention and like hopefully even help hold pressure and feet to the fire on this, but um, summary details has problems. Um, it has like some accessibility problems. Like it has problems in its design. And um, you know, when we said we were going to tackle this and the summary details would be like the base on which we would build um, a number of us said, okay, we agree to that. As long as we address these issues uh, that uh, Scott O'Hara provided a nice list of issues that need to be addressed in summary detail. So here's hoping that those will all be addressed and summary details will get much, much better because of this focus as well. Yeah, like 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 you said, um, summary details or the exclusive accordion is is a is a very much debated topic <laughs> um, because yeah, you're basically saying to your users you can only see one thing at the same time. Um, so maybe you shouldn't use the exclusive accordion, but when you need it, well, I, I think um, I like this because now when you need it, you no longer need to rely on some checkbox hacks, uh, some checkbox hacks. Or some JavaScript to make it work. Now it's it's baked in the, into the platform, and like you mentioned, all these other accessibility um, issues that are not specifically tied to the exclusive recording, but to like detail summary in general, um, are also on our radar to, to 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 have it solved over time. Because yeah, accessibility is important, right? We need to solve this. Yeah, and that's been um, an area of some. Uh, debate over some of these changes like the exclusive accordion and horizontal rules and select, which is another thing that uh, was in your article. Um, it's more of an HTML feature really, where you can put an HR inside a select element in order to create little visual divisions in a, in a drop down menu. Um, and this is in, I think it's in all, maybe it's not in WebKit. I'm not sure, but it's in Firefox and Chrome and Oh, no, it is also in, in Safari, according to the article. So it's yes, in all so the browsers. Safari, yes, Safari were the, were the first to ship it. Um, and I didn't really see that one coming. And then a bit later on, it was like, oh, yeah, um, we should also do this. Um, so sometimes it, it's an idea that's not really part of a plan. Uh, so it, it wasn't part of interop. Um, but other vendors saw Safari implementing this, and they were like, oh, yeah, we, we can also do it, and we, we should also do this. And now it's, it's, in, all, it's, it's in all browsers. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, and, but there have been some concerns raised about it. And so it will, it'll be interesting to me because it seems like this one did happen very quickly and sort of without a, much of a plan and now kind of fits in all the browsers and, you know, has, has it been properly vetted? I'm, I'm not sure personally, uh, but it'll be interesting to see where that goes. 
I, one other one that I didn't realize, um, I'm not entirely sure how I missed this, um, since we actually did a show on this, the inert attribute in Firefox 112, apparently in April 10th, 2023. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's also, uh, another, uh, HTML oriented thing, uh, HTML DOM oriented thing, the inert, um, like basically is a way to have something in the tree and say this and all his children, like you just pretend it doesn't exist. Um, it's very useful for building certain kinds of UI patterns where. Yeah. Without a nerd, you are able to tap from a dialogue into a link in the DOM that's hidden underneath the dialogue, like right. visually underneath. And so that totally didn't make sense. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I, I think is really fun to mention is that this seems to be a year in which there was just like a whole bunch of new uh, excitement and energy around novel and experimental engines. Um, like we had uh, renewed interest in Servo. Egalia has been working on Servo. Uh, and... Uh, with uh, some funding from an organization and we sure could use more if you if you're excited by that uh you definitely could support that um give us reach out to us uh ladybird which um is andreas kling we had him on and talked about that project yeah um, very exciting project ladybird i like it yeah that one actually is getting some interesting funding now too so um that's great. And then uh, Shadow is a uh, a really new experimental one uh, by a friend of ours who's now at um, Mozilla. We'll probably need to ask them on. Yeah, I think it's, 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 it's great to see like these new engines pop up um, because I'm, I'm a big fan of, of browser diversity. And you might be saying, oh, yeah, this is weird. You work at Google. You have like the biggest user base or whatever. Um, but I'm really a fan of, of this browser diversity because together we, we pull each other forward and uh, the, the, the rising tide lifts all boats, right? And and sometimes you need smaller boats and the big boats to, to all work together and and go forward with things. Um, One of the really, really interesting things we pointed out on the, the Ladybird show, and it's, it's happened a number of times since then, and I'm like, oh, I'm so glad we called that out. Um, is that there because these projects are like implementing fresh everyone that comes along that implements fresh uh does that thing that we were talking about like finds a hole in the spec or finds something that needs clarity or finds something that's like just wrong and you know our interoperability on those is like mostly accidental or something um and so they they all improve the spec um every one that comes along and implements it so i think that's uh, another thing that they can do, even if they don't wind up being like some competitor engine. Um, it's difficult to imagine like the hobby projects evolving to compete, but who knows? WebKit, which is, you know, the basis of both WebKit and Blink, you know, was it is from KHTML and KSVG. And uh, KSVG was made by two guys who work at Egalia. And one of them, when they started, Nico was... Uh, I think 13, uh, maybe he was 15. I don't know. We did a show on it. It was like one of the first shows that we did. You could go listen to it, but, uh, yeah, it could happen. I mean, it would take a really long time, but it could happen. I don't know. What else do you have? Anything else that's on your mind? Something else that, um, you think is interesting that happened this year? Yeah. What, one of the things that we didn't mention that land in CSS are, uh, access to the new color spaces and the new color functions. Okay. Right, that's really um, because we we've seen a lot of design systems where you have like your base blue, and then you want to want to make it a little bit darker or a little bit lighter. Um, so you need to like pre-process those up front. Um, whereas now you you can do it in CSS with, with the color mix function, for example. You can mix your base color with ten percent black, and it will be a little bit more black. Um, and along with that, you can also choose which color space you want to mix it in. Um, so the new color spaces are also something that that's available across browsers nowadays. Um, because if you, if you look at RGB, it's like a little triangle of all the visible colors that, that, that we can perceive as a human, but then uh, a color space like display P3 is, has, is much wider uh, than, than the sRGB triangle. Um, so you can, for example, have an even hotter hot pink, um, 
that you can now access in, in all browsers. And then again, you can use these uh, to mix and to, to, to combine colors. It's, it's, it's so great. Or even the, the relative color syntax is also an interesting one where you can take an RGB color or just any color. But for, I'm giving an example now with an RGB color. You take that, you load it up in the HSL color space, and then you rotate the UE by, by 10 degrees, for example. And then you get a new color that you can use uh, in, in your styles. It's, it's, it's so cool to see. I, I feel like one of the difficulties that we have in the color stuff is that like frequently even the terminology seems complicated and um, like because part of it is like you have to understand that there's more colors and that's like mind blowing because you're like, do I need more? Like, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So like most people don't even know about like sRGB as like how that equates to like a color space. And we, the way we think about it, the way we write it and what it can represent are like actually three different things. And I feel like because we haven't spent a lot of time talking about this, like the terminology for it gets really tricky. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, I'm, um, I'm looking up the, the article written by Adam Argyle, colleague of mm -hmm. mine, and uh, in there he says, uh, a color space is a mapping of colors where a color gamut is a range of colors. Oh, so the, interesting. the gamut uh, targets the triangle on the t 2D image, and then the color space is, is basically a 3D representation of all those colors, like like uh, the RGB triangle, uh, the, the RGB uh, cube. Uh, th that, that's a cube. And then HSL is a cylinder, for example, uh, and all those other stuff. We should do a whole show on that. There's so many new things to color. Like it's such a deceptively simple seeming thing, right? Yeah, and it's, it's only in, until you start, like for example, if, if you um, make a linear gra gradient from uh, blue to white, in RGB, which which we are used to doing, you get mm -hmm. this like gray muddy area in the middle, and people are like, yeah, that that's how color works. Uh, but then if you start to know, if you learn to understand like the color space is RGB, oh yeah, the it's a three D movement from one part of the inside of the cube to another part, and you're going to this gray middle area. Yeah, if you don't understand right. how HSL and LCH work, you're like, oh, they don't have that because right. they don't have that problem. <laughs> Right. And then you have like lab and okay. Uh, having like more perceptual uniformity as you travel across that space. Right. Yeah. So you don't, you don't wind up in these weird rainbows that we don't think of, but it's how the, it's how the color system works. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I think like um, one of the problems with HSL is if you go from blue to white, you make a linear gradient, you end up with something pinkish. Yeah, right. In the it middle, make which any is like sense. weird <laughs> intuitively, but it makes perfect sense in the in the in the model. You understand yeah. what it's doing, <laughs> right? Yeah. So there's other um, interesting APIs, I guess. Um, the Origin Private File System got a, a bunch of progress this year. As I understand, um, I think that there is support in just about everything for most of it. I believe this is maybe um, used in uh, Photoshop for the web, um, if I'm not wrong. That's pretty cool. Um, import maps. Oh, import maps are great. They are yeah. so great. <laughs> Do you want to talk about import maps? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so with import maps, you can say when you're importing something in your JavaScript, import this function from that file, whatever. Um, if, if you're working in a Node.js application, it goes look into your Node modules folder and then it will find the file there. Um, whereas if, if you are using it on the web, well, you don't have a Node modules folder. And with import maps, you, you can map the file name to an actual location somewhere uh, available over HTTP. So that, that's really great because you can take your existing code that you wrote on your local machine that, you, that is using Node modules dependencies, you upload it to the web, and then the import map will map all the requests for of imports to actual files uh, somewhere on the web. It's so great. Yeah. You can just uh, have one version, upload it, it works. There's also um, progress this year on compression streams. Uh, that uh, I don't know a lot about. 
but uh, it's a way that <laughs> same you can here drawing pipe, a blank. You, it's a way that you can use in the stream interfaces. You can pipe through uh, like to say as the input comes in, I want to pipe it to through this compression stream, and using uh, like gzip. Uh, you can zip it as it goes through. So like what you do on, you know, uh, a server normally, and it's just sort of like done for you. Uh, this is now in primitive in the web platform and it is now supported in all of the places. So that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I think and, like and most other... people are dealing with streams all the time, but there are a lot of special uses of the web where you are dealing with streams and that's pretty great. Um, yeah, and another feature that I'm really excited about is is the linear easing function. Um, and and don't let the name fool you because if you think linear easing, you're like oh, yeah, going from zero to one on a straight line. Um, but with the linear easing function, you can like take a complex animation curve, something like a bounce effect, and then you just mark some dots on it that represent that curve. And between the dots, it will interpolate linearly. And if you have enough, if you, if you if you add enough dots to the line, you can like approximate a bouncy curve, and do that in CSS. Whereas before it it wasn't possible to do that. You needed JavaScript or needed some other library to do that for you, and now you can just take any curve, plot some dots on it, and Linear will do the job for you. And it's cross browser. It just shipped with uh, Safari seventeen point two, uh, which is out just now at the time of recording. So great. Yeah. Did we miss anything in the article that the three of you wrote? No, I think the the, the big lines are there. Um, one thing that's not part of the article um, is add property that landed in oh, yes, Safari, that's huge. That's but it's huge. not in Firefox yet. Um, but yeah, that's that's huge because with that property, you, you can register a custom property to be of a certain type. You can say like, hey, this custom property is going to be a number. So it's going to be from zero to, 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 to 255, for example. Uh, but what's really cool is that once you have registered your custom property using add property to be of a certain type, it's animatable. So if you change it from zero to 255, it just won't switch discreetly from the zero to the 255. It'll actually add up zero, one, two, three, four, and so on and so on. So you can use that in animations. It's so cool. Just change the custom property value, use it in a calc somewhere. For example, you can have something go from zero to 360. If you then use a custom property in an HSL function to, to set the Huey for a color, it will animate the Huey as the animation is running. It's amazing. Yeah, I think there's so many things that that opens up. Um, I'm really glad that we finally get interop on that. Um, I think that is... Um, hard to appreciate, but will be one of the more important things in the web platform in the next several years. Like, it, like if you look back, you can see things that were like really, really huge additions that are kind of otherwise like sort of low level. Like they're not like they don't all by themselves do a thing, you know. Um. And I'm not saying that's low level. I mean, comparatively, it's pretty high level. But, you know, when you think about it, it doesn't by itself do something, right? Like, it's just a, a way for you to define a, a primitive value and just say, like, this this is a property that I'm making up, and it is of this type. Uh, enables all kinds of things. And, like, if you look back, you have, like, things like promises or, like, XML HTTP request or fetch, like, these these things that had this really outsized use you know there's like all these things that you could do with it that led to a lot of imagination and uh, different things I, I think that that is going to be one that will just be used in so many cool ways yeah it has really changed how i how i approach certain things like on hover i i change a, a dash dash i from zero to one but I then use that dash dash I throughout the rest of my code and everything automatically adapts itself, transitions, animates. It's, it's, it's so cool. It's, it's had so much impact on how I write my code. That's great. Speaking of the things like, you know, fetch and promises, there's a bunch of things that happen in TC39 and in just sort of like related groups. Um, this year we got uh, well-formed Unicode strings. That is... Uh, 
like very low level and i think it is mostly on the back of wasm so if you read web idl stuff you see like dom string a lot but then there's also this usv string and it's like about how you like can sort of like translate between them i think and that's needed for web assembly and other things atomics await async is uh similarly low level it's a way for you to like wait on a, a value like a atomic like either synchronously or asynchronously i think um but also it's not a thing that most people ever write themselves i think resizable and growable array buffers is another <laughs> example that's like that lots of things use these array buffers in the web platform a lot of the like low level things but till now they're like fixed size and this is a way that you can like allow them to grow. Um, you have to say how, like what sort of like their max grow. What about regexes? Do you use a lot of regexes? Do you write a lot of JavaScript? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I write, I write JavaScript from time to time. No worries about that. Regexes, you, you either hate them or you hate them a lot, right? <laughs> right, yeah. You have a problem and then you use a regex. Now you have two problems. Um, exactly. no, I, I love them. I mean, I use them all the time. Um, but, uh, yeah, I remember like one of my very first jobs, I got partnered up with this very, very senior engineer and we were working on this thing that was like really way over my head, but I was in that phase you are when you're young, where you just like, you know, like you just really want to solve the problem and you don't really have enough knowledge to solve it well. So you just keep trying until you get a solution, you know, sounds familiar. Um, <laughs> But this senior engineer just came in like at the end and just like, it's like, let me show you how I can take this, you know, 80 lines of code and like replace it with this regular expression. And I was like, what just happened? <laughs> Teach me this magic. Um, yeah. We, we recently had a fun bug in, in DevTools related to regular expressions. So, so when uh, parsing values in CSS, we were like, doing some estimated guesses like, okay, this parses as a color, so we should show the color picker. This parses as an angle, so we should show the angle tool and whatnot. And um, with the tangent function being available, which is tan, and then you open the parents and then you, you pass in uh, an angle, I think, or, or a number, uh, you pass in an angle. Um, we were showing the color picker. Uh, we, ah, we still I are. remember <laughs> this. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Because Tan is an actual color, and the regex for the colors was like, oh yeah, here's all the named colors, just regex them on the value. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so the reason that I brought up the regex is that there's uh, this uh, V flag with set notation, which I, I just wanted to bring up because like, uh, I do think it's one of those things that might be interesting to a lot of people where uh, they say like with set notation, you can think about your characters sort of like sets, and you can do like... Um, you know, intersections and, um, you know, uh, exclusions and things like that. It's pretty Ooh. interesting. It's, it's worth looking it up. Yeah. That one maybe is again, less used than the, the last two that I think will be really used. Uh, one is array grouping. Do you know the group by things? Have you seen those? Yeah. I heard of those. I think that this, these are like, other examples of the web catching up, whereas we, we've had these functions available in Lodash for, for quite a while and have been using them. And now you're actually part of the platform. Uh, so great that it landed uh, across all engines. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is a thing that, I don't know, I've done a, a million and two times, I think. So yeah, um, I, I, like, I like the example that's given on, on MDN where you have like an inventory of items and then you can group them by, do we need to restock them or not? And you basically yeah. pass in a function, check the quantity. If it's less than five, they go into the restock pile. If it's bigger than five, uh, then they go to, into the okay pile. Yeah, I think 99% of programming is like massaging data um, into <laughs> I love things that, that expression. are easier massaging to data. process. And then string munging. That, that's like 99% of the engineering in my career i think um i like the expression that you did that you used here uh, massaging data that's basically <laughs> what we're doing yeah. yeah yeah uh and then the last thing that i see that got to stage four this year is uh promise dot with resolvers and this is very much like what you just said like it's um it's a thing that everybody has had to do there are ways to do it, it doesn't really unlock 
new capabilities necessarily as much as make it like a lot easier to express a thing. Um, so like when you create a promise traditionally, it's, a I can't remember the name of this pattern. There's a name for this pattern. Do you know what it is called? It's like revealing constructor or something like that. Um, Drawing a blank here. But like the function itself receives a resolve function and a reject function. Um, like what the outside gets back is just a promise. But frequently the outside wants to like also create or specify even later sort of like the the way that this will be resolved and so the with resolvers like lets you address that but i see what 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 this is aiming at um yeah it looks like a great addition to the platform yeah boy did we miss anything there's a lot of things in here uh, I, I bet we we missed a lot of stuff um because i'm mainly focused on on css and web ui um, so all the stuff that's happening in, in JavaScript land or, or in other places, um, like I often see them float by. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm too preoccupied with all the CSS stuff um, because like like you mentioned at the very start uh, of this episode, like keeping up with all the new advancements in web is, is so hard nowadays because it has exploded so much. And even if it is my full-time job now to, to keep track of all the CSS stuff, it's already a lot. Um, there's three of us in our team, Adam Argyle, Yuna Kravitz, and I, and we're all busy, busy, busy um, <laughs> with all the CSS and Web UI stuff. And even then, internally, we sometimes have to say, like, no, sorry, we, we, we can't support this new feature that you're shipping because we have other priorities to to take care of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's not, it's just not possible. But um, what do you think about uh, coming forward? Like, what's coming up next year, do you, do you see for the web platform? <laughs> um, we won't hold you at anything. These are just, these are your personal guesses. Yeah. Or just like, what are you really excited about? What do you, sure. or what even, here's one, like what is a use case that isn't being handled that you wish we would take up? You personally, so, not on behalf of Google. So, so one of the things that I am looking forward to um, is at property um, actually getting mm. shipped everywhere um, and, and getting, getting cross browser support properly. Um, but along with that, um, I'm also looking forward to like some of the performance um, improvements along that. Um, because for example, if, if you animate a custom property right now in every browser um, that supports that property, um, that animation happens on the main thread and it's blocking. So if you animate dash dash I mm. from zero to one, ooh, it's main thread. So it, it's, it's not good. And um, so I hope there, there's a, um, there's a room there uh, where where these type of animations, these type of transitions can also run off the main thread um, so that, yeah, all our websites will remain fast. And then, of course, there, there's the big chunks like view transitions, uh, scroll-driven animations. Um, there, there's very positive signals from other vendors. Um, they, they've also started working on things. Like, for example, there, there are commits for scroll-driven animations and view transitions landing in WebKit as we speak right now. Um, so I'm quite confident that these will, will become available in, in other browsers other than just Chrome. Um, so very much looking forward to that. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. Well, hopefully it'll, we'll get, we'll get that and more. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm very much looking forward to, to interrupt 2024 when the list uh, gets, uh, gets announced. Uh, yeah. So looking forward to that. And then interrupt 2025. <laughs> yeah you know because some we can't get everything the same way we can't keep up with everything we can't put everything in in any given year of interop so um yeah once that list comes out and we're able to talk about it you know there will never inevitably be the well why didn't you include this and i was like well maybe next year um just because you know at a certain point you you have to stop there are way too many proposals but anyway yeah we'll uh we'll worry about that in the future what about you, Eric? Um, like, could you give anything that you're like currently looking forward to or that you wish we'd focus on that we haven't focused on or like what, what's your, um, you know, like what's your, your holiday wish? Um, I mean, I did a wish list at the beginning of the year and, and I should have gone and looked at it before we did this episode. 
I think for me, it's, it's more, I'm looking forward to the community adapting to and exploring uh, the stuff that came this year, right? Like has and all the browsers and, and maybe not CSS nesting so much, but container queries and, um, you know, other queries like that, just people figuring out really uh, like clever ways to use those, um, you, know, you know, things that maybe weren't anticipated. Boy, I really what like your you, answer. Brian? That's a good one. <laughs> Uh, I, I hope we do more and more of that, um, studying the web yeah. and, and like just sort of sitting back yeah. and learning what is being done, you know, um, because we, we do point when there are clear signals throughout this show, we've said, oh, look, this is another example of like the cow path getting paved, but there, you know, there's more opportunities for us to do that, um, and to learn from it. And I, like, I wish we did that as a, you know, like, I wish that was part of what the w3c did for example hmm. yeah stacking on to what eric just said like that that he hopes that people will start exploring all the new stuff um with that very important like also be vocal if something is not working for you if features are missing on the web platform because that's the info that we as devrel we we also want to collect like yeah. how can we make your experience as a developer much better if you need five thousand lines of code to do something very stupid that's not good we want to know that so please, please, please reach out to us, blog about it, uh, catch us on social media, whatever, speak to us at a conference. And we're very open to feedback on, on all the stuff that's ha that has shipped and will soon be shipping. Yeah. So, I mean, there's several things that I, as a, you know, somebody who cares about the web would like us to solve. And they're mostly like the hard problems that I've seen kind of drag on. So those are things like MathML investment. Um, MathML core is supposed to set out the interoperable subset that's furthest in Chromium and it needs work in WebKit and Firefox. And that stuff is just really hard to prioritize today. Uh, SVG also similar, like needs work. It's really hard to prioritize. And those two, I think are historically special. I've, they're historically special and historically weird. And we have been trying to like unweird them. I would like us to just prioritize finishing that work and just I think also Shadow Dom has lots of really hard problems left. Um, some regarding accessibility, some regarding like what even should it be? What does it want to be when it grows up? Um, There's stuff in there that I, I really would like us to finally solve. I mean, I think those are really my biggest ones, but I would like us to like revisit Houdini. I think we focused, you know, like, on the wrong things in Houdini, but I think like we spent a lot of time talking about like custom properties and things, but we also had on that radar, like custom media queries, custom functions, you know, th those would be, I think really important and huge if we could get them done, they would allow you to like polyfill those kind of things and to suggest new ones and get, gain some experience with them that we could learn about before we bake them into the platform. So. Yeah, those are my cool. Yeah, no, uh, that those are really uh, that's all really good, and um, hopefully all that happens this year. So, Brahmas, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Yeah, thanks a lot for asking me, and I'm very much looking forward to to the future episodes on maybe scroll driven animations, Definitely. few transitions. You know how to reach me. <laughs> yep, we do. Thanks. Bye.